Hello, it's Shrunken Shrine again. Today's cookies have cinnamon and vanilla, the tea is green, and the plant wouldn't mind some water. Help the plant help yourself. Welcome, and thanks to anyone returning from the last video. Without wanting to make it sound like the last shrine offering was a hit or anything, questions from friends, passers-by, and my therapist were asked almost immediately about the next one. What would it be about, and when would it be out? I was so preoccupied with getting the first one out the door that I hadn't really thought about it. Certainly, segments and ideas for the previous video hit the cutting room floor, but unlike the first shrine offering, I didn't have a theme ready to go. Then, an inspired vision came to me from a realm accessible to only one mind in a millennia. I knew what Shrine Offering 2 must be. A follow-up about follow-ups. I was very pleased by the positive reception, but now I've put something out there in the world for this second video to be directly compared against. Even if they're just my own, there are now expectations. See, I know myself, well, a tiny bit. I've made things I've been proud of in the past, only to decide that they aren't as good as the arbitrary bar I set for myself, and then chuck them in the bin, and later regret throwing them out completely. Simply put, this video may not be as well received as the first by myself or others. We have a term for this, the sophomore slump. The reasons for a follow-up for something being made don't always align with those of the original. The indie band that turns out a surprise hit album finding themselves struggling to replicate the success now that there are fans or a contractual obligation with a label. The team responsible for a successful film having to make the call as to whether or not they double down on the elements they think made it work in the first place, or shaking things up for something more novel. Good sequels? Bad sequels? I'm not too fussed about making judgement calls like that. What I really find interesting are how different forms of media navigate the challenge of inherently being in the shadow of an original work. So, with my own stakes of a similar type on the line, albeit one so low an ant wouldn't be able to trip over them, let's talk about some unusual sequels. He's a good cop, basically a good cop. He's got good punches every once in a while. All right, fine, fine, give him a fine, chance. Fine, fine. Just keep him off my back. Florida's Mackel Brothers invite you to join the Great Escape. The French Connection, released in 1971, was a big bloody deal, but you knew that. Eight Oscar nominations, five wins, two BFI awards, four Golden Globes, the list goes on. Most importantly, it's also one of your dad's favourite films. If you don't think you've seen it yourself, You'll remember it as being the one that he always shouts you into the living room for, so you don't miss the still-stunning elevated train and car chase. There's a lot more to it than just the big set piece, of course. While the story really is as simple as a dodgy cop going after a not-much-dodgier heroin drug lord, it's a moody, tense, and deliberately documentary-style thriller where you always feel like you're party to something you shouldn't be. It masterfully maintains an atmosphere of making you, the viewer, feel like you're constantly in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if you know what's good for you, you saw nothing and you'll keep your goddamn mouth shut. Unless you should be talking, in which case, do it now before something happens to your face, knees, or both. And that's just around the cops. Hey, shithead. When's the last time you picked your feet? Huh? Yeah, what's he talking about? I've got a man in Poughkeepsie who wants to talk to you. You ever been in Poughkeepsie? Huh? Have you ever been Poughkeepsie? Hey, man, come on, give me a break. Hey, yeah, come on, what you come talking on, about? Let me hear you say it. Come on. Have you ever been Poughkeepsie? You've been in Poughkeepsie, haven't you? No. I want to hear it! Come on! Yes, yes, yes I've, I've been You've been there, right? Yeah, yeah. You sat on the edge of the bed, didn't you? You took off your shoes, put your finger between your toes, and picked your feet, didn't you? That's it! Yes! Anyway, it's one thing for a sequel to a hit film to bomb, or get a critical panning, or both. That happens fairly often. It's quite another for it to have left behind such minimal cultural impact compared to its popular predecessor that it regularly surprises people or becomes an item of pub trivia that it even exists. Such is the case with the rather directly titled French Connection 2. Whereas the original was based on a book, which in turn was based on real-life events, the sequel is entirely fictional, with only two returning characters in its protagonist Jimmy Popeye Doyle and antagonist Alan Charnier. 
At the time of writing, French Connection 1 has 135,000 ratings on IMDb, while 2 has only 21,000. Likewise, the first film has been seen by over 175,000 letterbox users, while the sequel has only been seen by 14,000. Not even your dad knows it came out. It's not even particularly disliked. It has simply fallen through the cracks, and is well due for critical re-evaluation. So, let's connect some more French. I think that anyone who has seen and liked the first film could be pleasantly surprised by the elements that it picks up and runs with, and others it pointedly drops entirely. At first, there are signs everywhere that they're going to try to get the original's lightning to strike twice. Even though it's directed by John Frankenheimer, instead of legendary director and ardent film set safety advocate William Friedkin, several opening shots of Marseille echo the surveying pans and sudden, tight zoom-ins and outs. The opening credits look almost identical, and the original movie's composer, Don Ellis, returns to punch-up proceedings. Our main character, Detective Doyle, arrives in Marseille in an increasingly deranged pursuit of a drug kingpin. Immediately, he's out of his element, as are we. He doesn't speak any French, and unlike the first movie, we aren't getting the luxury of subtitles this time around either. As Doyle flounders with the language barrier, and his usual modus operandi fails repeatedly, and seriously jeopardises both himself and the French police, the film gradually moves away from how the first film looked and felt. When it's revealed that Doyle has illegally brought along his firearm in the stitching of his suitcase, the score treats him with the kind of harsh synth tones and ominous horns that would have been reserved for the villains or moments of high tension in the first film. I personally wouldn't, but you could make a case that the first film's suspense and exciting action glamorise Doyle, a racist whose gut instincts get several people, including other officers, killed, even if the hunches he acts on later prove to be right. French Connection 2 gradually drops the first film's distant shot framing for a more intimate journey with Doyle's desperation. And it's horrible. He's not only washed up and refuses to try to speak French, but his incompatibility with everyone else around him adds a special flavour of frustration that most films would try to avoid having their main men radiate. It's pathetic enough seeing him bounce off of the type of women he was able to wrangle into bed in the first film, but with the instincts and networking he had in New York City out the window, all he has left is recklessness and violence. Two. Kneecaps. Oatmeal. I'm going to make oatmeal out of your fucking kneecaps. When I get done with you... If the incongruity between the two films intrigues you so far, pause and jump ahead to another segment in the description below, right now, because I cannot go further without talking about the film's biggest surprise and its ending, which aren't one and the same thing. Having seen Doyle completely screw the investigation at every turn in the first act, the entirety of the second takes a daring left turn and deprives him of agency completely when Charnier's men kidnap him and spend three weeks injecting him with heroin until he spills what he knows of their operation. He knows nothing except what Charnier looks like, which is the only reason he was dispatched to Marseille. Out of what seems like spite, underestimation, and possibly even pity, Charnier has the half-dead, totally addicted Doyle dumped outside a police station, where he is then secretly rehabilitated in a cell. This whole thing adds up to a gruelling 40 or so minutes of runtime. I've read reviews both from the time and the present day argue that Gene Hackman is both excellent at conveying the torture of dependence and withdrawal, or that he's hamming it up for melodramatic effect. Being fortunate enough to have not seen anyone go through such a thing in real life, I can't attest to that, but to draw a cinematic comparison, I find this far more visceral and upsetting than Trainspotting's famed cold turkey sequence. We learn that Doyle is a lapsed Catholic, went to school with Mickey Mantle, and could have been something of a ball player himself, possibly, if things went a bit differently. Okay. You know, 
saw him baseball did you? He seems to hate himself, but is able to stop thinking about it too much by channeling that hate into his work. Although later actions like saving Inspector Bartholomew's life and getting his revenge upon the smugglers don't redeem him, French Connection 2 trades its license as a sequel to double down on the thriller elements to instead more fully round out a character who has lived a life of refusing to confront countless demons, doggedly going after people he considers even worse. If nothing else, it gives us the greatest the proper way to end your film style ending ever. Here is the ending of French Connection 2. Enjoy. Kanye? <sighs> This one's called The Last Person in the Country with a Checkbook 2. The year is 2117, and Lakshmi Manon has just become the only person in the country with a checkbook. When it arrived, she had to look up how to use it. Her bank had even sent it with a nice Grantham Group slipcover, like some kind of vinyl holster for signing away money at a moment's notice. Sighing heavily, she carefully printed the name of her landlord on the blank line following the word pay. Jeff Tyndall. She did crack a smile that she was advised to write only after the amount, though. 3,760 euros. Only. She didn't date the cheque. First, she would have to actually get that much into her account, but rent was due in just four days. She squeezed her eyelids and thought about her encounter with Jeff earlier that week when he'd informed her that he'd only be accepting his rent in the form of monthly checks from then on. I'm having my hand forced here, love, Jeff had told her. It's not just tenants having to tighten their belts these days, you know. I understand that, but that's just how my income is. I, I'm not salaried, Jeff. I get paid on, well, commissions, tips. Jeff put an arm on her. Look, I'm not pointing fingers, and believe me, you're not the only tenant in this building who pays less in some months and more in others. It's rough times for us all, and I need a firm handle on what's coming in and when it's coming in. Can't make plans around money coming in fits and starts. There's an easy way around that, she thought to herself, clenching jaw and fist. Just don't make any plans. Having only gotten back in from work at 5am, Lakshmi received a relatively early call from her bank at 9am sharp. On the other end came the perfectly intonated voice of a rather voluble female staff member. Good morning, Miss Menon. I know direct calls from your bank are unusual, but far less so than ordering a new checkbook. Ah, that, Lakshmi started. Well, I've never had a reason to use one bef- Did you know, Miss Menon? that among the 27.3 million accounts with the 13 banks and building societies under the Grantham Group umbrella, yours is the only one to have requested a new checkbook in the last four years? I... well, is that so? Lakshmi sighed, looking over the undated check again, unsure what to make of this while digging gunk out of an eye. In as much detail as you're comfortable in sharing, Miss Menon, what circumstances in your life have changed recently that necessitate a checkbook where biometric payment, cards, or online banking are insufficient? Well, my landlord said he would only be accepting my rent in checks from now on, which seemed... Sleep well, Miss Menon, knowing that however you choose to use your checkbook, you will never once have to use it to pay your rent. The line went dead. Dumbfounded but too tired to dwell on it, Lakshmi put her phone back in its charging dock rolled back over, and actually drifted off much easier than earlier. Jeff had a less peaceful evening that same day. For one, his heart skipped a beat when he lifted his key to his front door, and it swung open effortlessly. He may have forgotten to lock his door, but he certainly didn't go out that morning having turned on the heating and what seemed like every light in the house. Stood at the opposite end of his hallway from the front door, was an imposingly tall woman in an off-white trench coat. 
Good evening, Mr. Tyndall. It was an extremely authoritative, full tone. It wasn't a greeting, it was a fact. How did you get in here? He roared. This is my property, and you are breaking and entering. I'm calling the pu- For what benefit would a landlord in the year 2117 decide to prevent tenants from being able to deposit funds in their account except through handwritten checks? This question cut him off in a way that made him feel that his protestations weren't ignored as much as she couldn't even hear them, as an ant might scream seeing its hill about to get stepped on. To deter tenants from being late with their rent, Jeff answered, having lowered his tone. Cooler heads prevail, he told himself. And it wouldn't, the woman started walking towards him as she continued, have anything to do with circumventing certain tenancy agreements that allow tenants to postpone eviction proceedings by depositing rent even if it isn't the full amount? Now arm's length from him, Jeff's aged neck felt uncomfortable trying to maintain eye contact with her. Even down the hallway, she looked six feet tall. Now, directly before him, she must have been at least seven. It was uncanny, like looking at someone in a circus mirror. Why on earth did she turn the heating on? It's August, and that coat she has on looks a half inch thick. It's not illegal, he said. It's it's tough times for us all, and I need a firm handle on what's coming in and when it's coming in. It can't make plans. The woman interrupted Jeff by putting the fingers of an outstretched hand half an inch away from making contact with his throat. No longer able to convey it in speaking, Jeff would later tell the police via handwriting that the last thing he remembered her saying was, do not make any. For the remainder of her tenancy, Lakshmi never saw Jeff again in person, as all dealings with him were done either through text message or his sons Shane and Anthony, who told her that biometrics and direct payments were once again fine to use to pay her rent. The unfinished check was never dated, let alone given to Jeff. The last time she ever even thought about it was a week later when she called her bank to let them know that she likely wouldn't need the checkbook anymore and if it should be returned or destroyed. The familiar Grantham Group representative on the other end told her to keep it just in case. In this day and age, Miss Menon, I dare say that a request for a new checkbook is tantamount to a cry for help. Take care. Compared to other forms of popular culture that receive sequels, many feel that on average, video game follow-ups normally turn out quite well. Sequels to movies, books, and other mediums have to primarily concern themselves with moving their characters, worlds, or themes forward in a narratively satisfying way when those elements may have already been thoroughly explored enough. As a primarily interactive medium, games don't suffer from this quite so much. People tend to roll their eyes less at the notion of a Grand Theft Auto 6 or the 20th or so mainline Zelda game because those series have come so far in the depth and variety of gameplay they can offer. New characters, stories and locations can be created and may be received more or less warmly than those in earlier entries, but core gameplay systems can be refined, iterated and built upon game after game. It took some time for this to be considered the way to do things, however. When the Japanese console market was really finding its feet with the success of Nintendo's Famicom in late 1984, the sequels for several bestsellers weren't always reprisals of their already popular formulas and could be quite daring in how they overhauled their gameplay. As examples, Zelda 2 isn't a top-down action-adventure, but more of an early and surprisingly difficult take on what we would recognise now as a side-scrolling action RPG. Castlevania II, Simon's Quest, jettisoned the linear action platforming of its predecessor for more of an exploratory adventure with famously cryptic progression. It took some of these follow-ups many years to achieve some degree of positive fan reappraisal, but let's talk about one that may never really get it, despite having had a lot of time and second chances in the years since its initial release. <laughs> Final Fantasy II was released in Japan in December 1988, officially making its Western debut on the PlayStation in 2003. However, 
a fan translation by Neo Demiforce had been making the rounds as early as 1998, which quickly helped it gain a worldwide reputation as being an odd duck. FF2 regularly languishes at the bottom of overall series rankings from critics and fans alike. Even with numerous gameplay adjustments and coats of paint in the years since, its late 80s vintage continues to make it a struggle for even fans of the series to revisit or finish. 36 years on, and 14 plus numbered sequels to its name later, I'm going to go to bat for FF2 a little bit. I didn't even bring my rose-tinted glasses. I didn't know I actually really liked RPGs until late 2017. I'm not going to talk about sky-high encounter rates, glitch mechanics, or labyrinthine dungeon designs, as those kinds of things were endemic to late 80s RPGs, as well as Final Fantasies before and after 2. Instead, I'm going to pick out three features unique to FF2 that detractors often pick as bones of contention and chuck in my two cents, and hopefully maybe even get you to give it a go and make up your own mind. Let's get the big one out the way first, the activity-based stat progression. If you only have passing familiarity with FF2, then its individual skill-based growth system is likely what you've heard about it most. Unlike FF1, your characters don't have predefined jobs or classes, and they don't level up after accumulating enough experience. Instead, your individual actions level up the more you use them in battle. Your party can be remolded in almost any way you see fit, depending on how you command them in battles. For example, if you want main character Firion to build his base power stat, just have him dish out physical attacks. However, if he attacks with bows, he will eventually level up his bow wielding ability. Have him use axes instead, and he'll get stronger with axes. This also applies to magic. Any character can get better with any spell if you want them to. Just teach it to them, and have them cast it over and over. This goes all the way down to magic and health point growth. For the chance to expand your MP pool, you have to spend MP. Infamously, for the chance to gain more HP, you have to take damage. It's like building muscle, you've got to tear them a bit to build them back stronger. A well-known, if very boring way of trivialising the challenge of FF2 is to get into a fight with weak enemies and have your own party members take turns walloping one another to drive up the likelihood of leaving battle with a higher health maximum. Furthermore, certain statistics can actually decrease over time. If you're an intelligence-reliant spell slinger and not clobbering stuff all that often, then your stamina will decrease. Your brain's the only muscle you're using, so the others atrophy, I suppose. Later remakes of FF2 did away with stat deterioration completely, but together with the unusual stat growth, FF2 gained a reputation as being a very difficult RPG, where resorting to beating yourself up is one of the only reliable ways of beating the game, a stigma it seems to have never fully escaped. This new progression system came from developer Akitoshi Kawazu. There's two things to keep in mind about Kawazu when you play one of his games. The first is that he is a nerd's nerd, and I mean that with the greatest respect. This guy would play imported English tabletop war games, without Japanese translations, with his friends. Hardcore. The second is that he's always experimenting. Kawazu had also created the more recognisably conventional battle system for the first Final Fantasy, but even then he had wanted to try a skill-based experience system. Because Final Fantasy was the company's first console RPG, and they weren't confident they could handle the additional data management that would necessitate, they played it safe with a more typical battle system concept. After its success, FF2 was Kawazu's opportunity to finally implement it. I'm not interested in deciding if the stat-based growth is air quotes good or air quotes bad, but I will say that it is as unique to Final Fantasy II as it is poorly understood. It's certainly not explained in the context of the original game itself. At a glance, it looks extremely similar to FF1, but even now you will likely want a manual, or FAQ, to help you understand what actions correspond to developing which stats. The trade-off is that you have much deeper control of building your characters through what they do in battle than anything else out on console at the time. 
There is no class system or story background guiding you to have Maria be an evasive healer or a dual axe wielding tank, but you can cumulatively whittle her into those through every command you issue her in every fight. Ignore the memes. You'll never need to attack your own party to raise your HP if you understand evasion and defense in the first place. Anyone can wear any armor, which sounds great, but will drop your evasion and spellcasting rates like an anchor if you just outfit people with gear that has high numbers. Specializing is almost always better than diversifying. Having a character who can cast a few powerful spells is more useful than one who knows many weak ones. So decide early what role you want each party member to fill. All this is to say that I think stat-based growth is an underexplored alternative to the traditional level up as a way of focusing on the role playing part of the RPG rather than the game part of the RPG. I think Kawazu is a person who deeply understands that RPGs are abstractions of more complicated fictional worlds and enjoys reinventing the wheel, so to speak, to make the experience more involving for the player in new ways. This isn't a genre that pursues realism in the way, for example, simulation games do. These are, after all, usually worlds of fiction and fantasy. But maybe it is possible to create alternative mechanics that function as a shorthand for some sort of logic or common sense we would recognize more intuitively than the typical experience points or level ups. Your character's ability scores in Dungeons & Dragons are simplified versions of factors that could be made more complicated to be more realistic, but at some point, Keeping track of those things for the sake of realism prevents it from being enjoyable. People have tried. All this is to say that FF2 is simply an ambitious early attempt to add a little more complexity and individuality to character building through battle decision making, albeit one that may have come at the very high price of easily understood gameplay. One not worth paying for many console RPG players at the time, who enjoyed more straightforward experiences such as the excellently streamlined Dragon Quest series. My next example of something that people point to as a unique failing of FF2 is a keyword system that feels next to pointless. Talking to certain NPCs will give you keywords that you can then use when talking to certain others. These amount to little more than keys for locks that prevent story progress. Talk to NPC number one get a key word, tell it to NPC number two when needed, and you can carry on with the game. As I just mentioned, RPG systems are usually abstractions of grander concepts. Stats represent characteristics, single overworld tiles represent towns and caves, and so on. The late 80s was a time where this genre was still getting through growing pains that make going back to many of these older titles feel like a chore. You know what I mean. RPGs hadn't worked out things we now take for granted, like don't restrict the player to buying only one of an item at a time. Try not to have difficulty spikes between towns so high that there aren't any safe or time-respecting grinding spots. Don't make the first town on the world map invisible? With that in mind, I see the keyword feature being an unintrusive attempt to borrow an idea from PC adventure games which had already firmly entrenched the idea of a set of verbs or a text parser your character could use to interact with the world. By having even this basic way of getting a little extra out of certain characters, it ever so slightly raised the bar for NPCs to be something more than a trigger to spit out a string of text. It's a precursor to things we now take for granted, like proper dialogue trees or morality systems that actually impact stories or stats. At best, it's a nice, if underutilized, idea, and at worst, it doesn't make the game any worse. In an interview, Kawazu once pointed to a specific bit of dialogue in Ultima 4 that I'd like to share. I want to find the meaning of life through dancing. Spoken by a human, or just a symbol of a human, and rendered by the low-resolution graphics of the Apple II, it was the moment when the dancer in the world of Ultima 4 and I first crossed paths. Needless to say, the world of Britannia in Ultima 4 is a fictitious place and only exists in the Apple II, 
and the dancer and the dancer's words are just a product of a person in Texas who worked on the game. However, it was Ultima 4 that clearly showed me that a creator can fabricate things like that, and it's okay to offer other things of value outside of just winning or reaching a goal. Can't really put it better than that myself. Moving on. The last divisive factor of FF2 I'll hone in on is that for the majority of the game, only three of your four party member slots will retain the same characters for the entire game, with the fourth slot featuring a revolving cast of temporary party members, including a white mage, a monk, and even the series' first, now iconic, dragoon. Some people don't like that these characters aren't as malleable or permanent as the others. In fact, several of them die, narratively, permanently. They dead dead. While the story is, in broad strokes, basically just Star Wars with a coating of anime melodrama, the impermanent companions nicely prefigure the now signature Final Fantasy story set pieces, and raise a good question about when or if RPG narratives are committing some sort of unwelcome overreach when they so regularly affect battle and gameplay. If nothing else, it accurately recreates the feeling of trying to maintain a tabletop campaign as an adult while players drop in and out due to responsibilities and their characters have to get written out. I'd wager Kawazu knows that feeling quite well. In summary, give FF2 a go, at least one of the modern versions, because they run faster and look nicer. There's a lot here that the best-loved FFs took and built on, but also some evolutionary dead ends that the series, and RPGs in general, didn't take that we may be able to bring back someday soon. We have the technology, and look how many people are willing to get back into CRPG systems for Baldur's Gate 3. If you're a fan of FF8, I'd say you owe it to yourself to check out the even blacker sheep. You might not have a great deal of fun, but you will see innovation, a lack of cynicism about the player's ability to work things out, and an amount of weight being punched above you still don't see often. These are all respectable qualities in sequels and ones that aren't always present in follow-ups that are actually more enjoyable to play. Can you think of a medium out there that doesn't get sequels? Would you say poetry gets sequels? What about paintings? You can whack a Roman numeral too after anything, I suppose. Hell, we do it with people. And wars. How about variations of very similar images? Does putting a number after those make them sequels? I'm not going to tell you what this collage is called yet, but it was made in 1965 by British pop artist Richard Hamilton. As soon as you've seen a still piece of art, you begin to form some ideas about it, regardless of knowing whether it's part of a series or a standalone thing. Here's my thoughts when I see this, in the order they come to my mind. Then we'll talk a little about still art as Sequels, if that's a thing. Because of her size and the strongly contrasting black tones of the photograph she is cut from, our eyes are probably first drawn to this woman standing in a room. We'll come back to her later when we get into the background. After that, your eyes aren't particularly guided, so you're free to explore this interior space in whatever order you like. I've heard it said that yellows and greens are the colours that tend to attract the human eye first, which is partly why road signage often uses them. I don't know how true that is, but let's continue there. This rectangle of green is topped with some sort of oozing carpet of reds and blues, and is likely our biggest clue that the room's perspective is totally off. If this is supposed to be light coming through a doorway, then it doesn't line up at all with either the wood effect linoleum underneath it, or the walls facing it. The room in the background this lady may have entered from also has this odd cubist skew to it. This strip of brown down the left hand side keeps us from feeling like we're also in the room, as though we're looking at her from around a corner, or possibly from outside a window. This somewhat eerie hovering monolith of a coloured television set features a frame of a famous Sapruder film. Besides that extremely retro-modern looking chair in the foreground, JFK's assassination is probably our only in-context signifier that this was made in, or at least depicts, the 1960s. Actually, 
You can't really tell in this photograph of this collage, but that chair is actually made out of a very thin piece of aluminium and topped with red balsa wood, attached directly to the block board that all these collaged elements and paint have been applied to. So there's a physical, textural, and even slightly three-dimensional element here that we're missing out on. We'll have to go and see it at the Tate next time we meet up, alright? Okay, time for my knee-jerk interpretation and floundering effort to tie this back into this video's theme. This work is called Interior 2. Now, here's what's come to be known as Interior 1. Actually, this image isn't even the first capital I interior Hamilton made either. This was predated by these collages, Interior Study A, Interior Study B, and Interior Study C. So, what we've been looking at in detail is, in a sense, Interior 5. However, these were all made within the space of a year between 1964 and 1965. As individual images, they obviously stand on their own, but they remix and iterate upon very similar elements. This mirror in the background of Interior Study A shows up again as an actual embedded physical mirror in the background of Interior 1. Hamilton's reframing of contemporary mass culture imagery isn't a million miles away from what Warhol and Lichtenstein were doing around the same time but is certainly less likely to find its way to an ironic bedroom poster or t-shirt. Personally, I find some mundane horror in the interior series, particularly two. Something about this woman looking away makes me think of an obliviousness or refusal to confront elephants in rooms, whether major world events or problems with your domestic life. A sense of seeking distractions from feeling out of place in a space that's supposed to be your own. Surrounding yourself with expensive creature comforts to fill some sort of void. What else has changed in 60 years, you ask? Now that we've had a look at the picture itself, I'd like to talk about how it was made. Just to say, I quickly recommend Richard Hamilton's biography, Introspective. Its background behind the making of the interior works informed much of this segment. Also, it was published in an unfinished state when he died in 2011, and was released as is complete with extra blank pages where more material would have presumably been. You may know Hamilton for his 1956 collage, just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? This is his best known work. In brief, Hamilton was sometimes frustrated that the images he wanted to use in his collages weren't always of an adequate size or quality. Perhaps the perfect figure in a magazine wouldn't fit with the other elements he had in mind. It's a similar frustration to finding the perfect image online, but it's too low resolution. So, he started asking billboard companies and local cinemas for unused materials they no longer needed, and these would often be larger or higher quality. One day, he came across a still from the 1949 film Shockproof. This wasn't a blown up image from the film itself, but rather a publicity shot with dedicated cameras on the film set itself, which could then be used as advertising materials or portfolio shots for the actors. Something about the still struck a chord with Hamilton. Film sets being what they are, there was something uncanny about the lighting coming from multiple sources, the set walls not quite seeming to line up, and actor Patricia Knight seemingly distracted by something offset apparently more involving than the dead body at her feet. There was a lot here for Hamilton to work with, and he did. Five times within one year, which is the interior series we've been looking at. Hamilton's composites built on this effect by putting cropped figures of a roughly suitable size in what looked like living spaces, but then robbing them of the context the women came from originally, and putting them in impossibly constructed rooms. The introspection book posits that the hand placement of the lady in interior study A could have been holding a vacuum cleaner and its cord. This woman was lying flat in a bedding advertisement before being rotated 90 degrees to appear stood upright in the unnerving and severely contrasting room of interior study B. The arm of this woman walking away into interior study C's background is at this awkward angle because she was originally leading a horse. 
Even Interior 1, the first to feature Patricia Knight, has her standing centre-left instead of hard-left, with a real pencil attached to this table-shaped void pointing straight at her. It's almost screaming, Look around you! What's going on? Is that blood on the floor? What on earth happened to your desk? Good lord, what is happening in there? If Interior 2 is a sequel to this, so to speak, it's probably to further advance this accusatory and broken environment for its displaced and oblivious humans. To wrap up, still art like photographs, sculptures, paintings, and so on, even when explicitly numbered or lettered like the interior collages, live a much more individual life and identity when seen in isolation, with or without knowledge of what came before. I don't think you'd get many people arguing over which of these is the best, even though they're all quite similar. Interior 2 itself actually started life as a backup in case anything should go wrong with the screen printing process for Interior 1, but was ultimately reworked into being its own thing. Today's Homes may be Hamilton's best known work, but it was made in a single day. The interiors were made over the course of a year. Perhaps he was never quite done with them, either. I suppose then, Still, art lends itself well to sequels born from fascinations and fixations than other mediums. People tend to get less angry about having their time wasted or accuse things of being too samey when it only takes a few milliseconds of their time, and subsequent pieces compel them to take the time to more fully dwell and draw an interpretation instead of simply moving on. Anyway, moving on. Alcohol is a depressant. Caffeine is a stimulant. And I'm the cure. <clears throat> Welcome back to Answers on a Postcard, the write-in segment where I talk about your comments on previous videos. Last offering, I asked, what's a bit of media that means a lot to you that you have no memory of finding for the first time? At under 200 views on that video as of today, I'm shocked and delighted that I have exactly one response to it. Uh, I'm going to share it with you right now. Alternate Grammar of Florida says, The example I thought of was a 2009 Japanese movie called A Cult. I do remember where I heard of it, from my then-girlfriend. But when she presented it to me, she said she didn't remember where she had found it. It's not going to be the most pants-crappingly scary thing ever if you watch it. In fact, it's a bit goofy. But it's a certain kind of goofy that adds to its unsettling tone, because it makes you feel like it's not meant for you to watch. Truly, it is just a movie. And I know of the director's other work, and it even contains a cameo from one of my personal favourites. So it's not much for mystery, really, but that's what I thought of when you asked the question. Thank you, Alternate Grammar for watching my video when the algorithm spat it in your general direction. Because you stumbled across my video, I actually went away and watched a cult, which I probably wouldn't have done if you hadn't left a comment. People and their tastes are just free radicals bouncing off one another, I guess. As for a cult, well, I mean, it's... I agree that it isn't out and out scary, but the documentary style, combining the misery of being borderline unemployed in Japan, while becoming delusional or developing destructive tendencies after surviving a traumatic experience, is, I think, a compelling use for now well-worn style of horror. Right, before I forget, during last video's segment on Goya's fight with cudgels, I said that you could have some fun by asking people who they thought was winning. My good friend Seb did so, with his answer being, me and the pet both say, whoever is watching the painting, whoever is asking that same question. Seb, I love you, but I think we both admit that your dog has greater media literacy than either of us. Love you. Hope you're doing well. All right. My question to everyone this time around is one that I'm stealing from my friend David. Are there any sequels to media important to you that you've been putting off or refuse to engage with because you worry it may affect your feelings about the original. I'll give an example. Uh, mine is Blade Runner. Uh, Blade Runner matters to me on a level that is simply 
not possible for most other films to reach just because of uh, the living situations it's found me in and the people I've shared it with who are no longer with me for one reason or another. When 2049 came out, I was worried that it may retroactively tarnish uh, some of those associations I'd made with the movie. Um, but it wasn't until it'd been out in cinemas for a few weeks, and it was just about to leave that I thought about it and I changed my mind, because I realised that what I treasured about the original was kind of immortalised by um, those memories that I'd had with the people I'd enjoyed it with in the first place. And it, it continues to find me in difficult situations throughout my life. And no matter how good or how bad 2049 would or could be, um, it couldn't possibly hope to touch those memories and what I cared about. Um, well, that and that one meme that was going around of the cinema marquee that said, you know, don't worry, they didn't screw it up. So that was reassuring in a funny way. Uh, anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, leave me a comment uh, if you've got any uh, bits of art that you've had a similar response to. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you're sitting comfortably, but not too comfortably. Something you often see decried about modern media is the prevalence of reboots and remakes, and what feels like an era where movie studios, TV networks, and game developers are less willing than ever to take risks on original works, rather than something that already carries some name recognition. I wonder if a good halfway point would be sequels or reimaginations that have been adapted for unusual mediums. I love seeing things find new life in forms they may have never originally been intended for. Here's one such example, with over 80 years having passed between the original and the sequel. The Human Chair is a 1925 short story by Japanese mystery author Edogawa Ranpo, who chose his pen name because, wait for it, it sounds pretty similar to Edgar Allan Poe in Japanese. Bring back wearing your influences on your sleeve like that, I say. According to James B. Harris, translator of the first English collection of Rampo's works, Rampo was the first Japanese writer to produce modern detective stories, even though translations of works by Western writers did exist in Japan at the time. He hardly seems to have been forgotten, but his influence seems to have remained mostly domestic, in some very interesting ways, as we'll soon see. The Human Chair introduces us to Yoshiko Tagawa, a popular writer. One day, she receives a manuscript for a story, but it's anonymous. It tells of a self-described workman who has built a luxury chair with a secret, human-shaped compartment that he can conceal himself within. Originally, he does this so that he can be delivered to the homes of his wealthy commissioners and rob them. Your man thinks of everything too. He has space for rations of water and hardtack, and even a catheter so he can stay in it for a few days at a time before making off with whatever he steals in the night. However, because the workman considers himself physically repulsive, he also believes this to be the only way he can know any physical intimacy, and begins to develop a bit of a fetish for when women sit on him. In him? On him. Hmm. Anyway, spoiler time. Go check it out. Link in description. It's like 15 pages long. Come back in 10 minutes. Eventually, the chair, with the workman still inside, is sold onto a diplomat, but his wife gets more use out of it because she does a lot of writing at home. The first twist is that the diplomat's wife is none other than Yoshiko herself, and she barely has the time to be horrified by that idea before the second twist comes around. A second letter arrives in the post from the same person, who claims they simply made the story up, and that it's indeed nothing but a fictitious manuscript. That's it. That's the ending. I respect it because this is the kind of ambiguity I like in my horror. It festers in my mind. Yoshiko will either cut open the chair and find out if the manuscript was truly just a fabrication, or take the manuscript author's follow-up letter at face value and try to put it out of her mind. Ranpo knew that whichever of those two possibilities the reader finds more unsettling is the one that they'll walk away with. Well played. His pseudonym is one thing, but I think the greatest device used by Ranpo that makes the Poe influence clear is how he often has characters directly deliver dread to the reader by having them relay their own demented actions in the first person. 
They say show, don't tell, but there is a deeply compelling suspense in creating someone unhinged and simply letting them recount their emotions and motivations for doing something really unsettling. By writing as though he is confessing his crimes to Yoshiko, the workman is also directly telling the reader his motives and feelings, and it's difficult to stop yourself from reading the next word. Gripping, basically. Now, let's talk about its unorthodox adaptation to manga by beloved horror comic author Junji Ito. Originally published in Japan's big comic original Zokan in 2007, it recently received an official translation in English as part of the 2020 anthology Venus in the Blind Spot. Ito is an increasingly famed name internationally now, and his take on the human chair serves as both an expanded retelling and sequel to the original Rampo story, while very much retaining Ito's strengths and trademarks. Anyway, I'm getting into spoilers for this right now, so bail and go pick up some Ito if you like how this looks. The Discord will probably point you in the right direction if need be. All good? Grand. Set in the modern day, Ito's human chair follows a struggling Tokyo-based writer, Yuzuho, as she visits a furniture maker's store while on holiday. The furniture maker tells her the original story of Rampo's human chair, but he expands on Yoshiko's tale, providing a definitive what happened next. In this retelling, Yoshiko, who has been continuing to use the chair for her writing, passes the workman's manuscript onto her publisher. It's a hit with readers, and even wins a prize. However, they are unable to get in touch with him, and Yoshiko begins to notice things in her life that line up with what the manuscript told her, such as how her husband came into possession of the chair, and hearing footsteps that shouldn't be in her home. Suspecting a burglar one night, Yoshiko thinks she sees the chair wriggling during the night, and her husband beats it with a wooden sword. A few days later, a third letter arrives from the workman slash author, disclosing things that only someone actually living in the chair would be able to know. The few wheels left on Yoshiko's life promptly fall off. Her husband becomes agitated and cruel, her writing begins to suffer, and her husband sits in the chair one night and gets stabbed through the back. The furniture maker's story ends with Yoshiko herself going missing, with the media spreading the idea that she murdered her husband. Back in the present day, the furniture maker shows Yuzuho a similar chair that Yoshiko and the workman supposedly lived in after her disappearance, and that he himself is one of their descendants. He then offers to make her a chair, which would be an absolutely baller practical joke to play on a tourist. Regardless, she leaves terrified. When Yuzuho returns to Tokyo, she receives an unexpected delivery in the form of a very similar looking chair and immediately freaks out, thinking she sees it moving. Red light, change pants. As a visual medium, the obvious thing to do would be to simply lean into manga's capacity to concretely depict unsettling things. But Rampo's ratcheting sense of dread is a great fit for the unease Ito builds page by page with his inky interiors and sad, haunted faces. You still get the occasional page turn jump scare that Ito is great at, like the chair reveals, but Ito takes Rampo's ludicrous concept, plays it with an unerringly straight face, then dares you to see who blinks first. Rampo's chair lives or dies by the reader's imagination and willingness to suspend their disbelief that someone could really create or survive in such a contraption. For every several dozen people who find this idea too goofy to be scary, there's probably one person who has to pat down everything they sit on because they have that one, extremely particular nerve that this touches. In my opinion, the greatest contribution that Ito's sequel brings to Rampo's story that a fully faithful adaptation couldn't, is in further rounding out the idea of a symbiotic relationship between Yoshiko and the workman. The idea of living in a bloody chair aside, they were two troubled people who suffered from completely different circumstances and found, if their supposed descendant is to be believed, love, fulfilment, and even family through the chair. Sending Yuzuho her own chair then could be a goodwill gesture that he hopes she finds similar peace in her writing. Unless he is indeed hiding in it, in which case bust out that wooden sword girl. In summary then, 
Adaptations and sequels don't always have to be completely faithful to the original work, and can benefit greatly from being built upon in a different medium. Ito isn't afraid to give us some definitive answers that Ranpo didn't, but he remains aware of the power of leaving behind a couple of unsettling loose ends that take advantage of his art, pacing, and tendency to find scares in the bizarrely specific, all while retaining the spirit and tone of Rampo's original. This is all very inspiring, so I'm off now to go work on my sequel to Slaughterhouse 5 as a Doom mod. Stay tuned. Of all popular forms of media criticism, I'd say music is the least reliable, even less than video game criticism. <laughs> to be a fully fossilised horse, music is subjective, but it's difficult to articulate how. With films, you can point to commonly understood elements like the pacing or the acting and discuss whether they're appropriate. With video games, you can describe factors like the gameplay or the graphics and the audience will know what's meant by those terms. Tastes play an intrinsic part in critiquing those mediums too, but judging music is more a matter of extremes. On one end, it can seem vague. Comments like, the production is too thin, or saying that a rapper has poor flow can be meaningful with genre knowledge, but might not be of much help to people without actually being able to hear the music for themselves. On the far other end, music criticism can get too clinical, like trying to explain how music theory choices can provoke certain emotional reactions. People who are musicians themselves can appreciate the science at work, but would likely agree a song is not always sad if it uses Pucklebell's canon progression, and it isn't always evil if it uses tritones. Never mind whether or not these are useful observations when making a recommendation in the first place. In short, talking about music is a challenge. What can we do to rectify that? Personally, I think it's better to try to disclose your current genre biases, point out the qualities of the music that stood out to you, then move on knowing it won't be for everyone. So, as for myself, I play bass, and recently I've been listening to an awful lot of surf rock and metal, and anything suitably jangly or funky between those two. But I like to think I'm fairly open-minded. For better or worse, Weird taste in music was what I had instead of a real personality between the ages of 16 to 19. Ah, now, those were the days. We would, of sound body and mind, install plugins for our media players that would upload data of the tracks we played and share them with our friends. Now we just let that data get mined automatically from us, and we're lucky if companies tell us what we heard as a bloody Christmas present. Where's the pride? We called them Scrubbles, and we had fun comparing how much life we'd wasted listening to Boris, damn it. Old man yells at Cloud. Anyway, let's talk music. Our theme is sequels, and it's often a struggle choosing just one bit of media to focus on. But then I find just the right thing. But then I find just the right thing. Apologies in advance for the absolutely dreadful audio quality that you're going to have to put up with in this segment. This is a very cheapo all-in-one CD player. At one time of day, I did have a rather nice uh, hi-fi setup that my grandfather was looking after until he decided that it was the perfect place to keep this big bastard cactus that he'd been feeding rainwater from a water butt that he keeps banana peels in because he thinks that potassium helps plants grow. Now, I'm no podiatrist, so I've got no idea whether or not there's any truth to that. But I can confirm it did completely crush the casing of the turntable and snap the assembly arm. Just <laughs> So we're going to have to make do with this in the meantime. Uh, the upshot is that the audio quality might be so terrible that it helps us dodge any potential rights issues further down the line. So, fingers crossed. I'm going to be jabbering all over it anyway. Let's try another song. Today we're talking about the private press. I have no clue right now whether or not you can see this. But this is the second album by DJ Shadow. He has seven studio albums, don't you know? And um, you have to feel kind of bad for him because when you're the guy who started his career with introducing, absolutely everything else you're going to do is going to be a footnote. 
which is tragic because I really rate this. It's just that it didn't quite you know, be the game changer that this album was. Genuinely, the guy was too influential for his own good. Um, kind of tragic, because I think that uh, private press rules for reasons we'll get into. Um, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Background, background. Uh, DJ Shadow is from California, and Introducing came out in 1996. Uh, this was probably the biggest thing to happen in instrumental hip-hop since... Uh, it Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back by Public Enemy, or Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys. The words instrumental hip-hop really cannot contain this album. Uh, the Guinness Book of World Records people say that this is the first album to be made entirely out of samples of other people's music, but that's Guinness. If I paid them 500 quid, they'd probably say that I'm Belgium's best-loved taxidermist or something, so take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. Build steam with it. Uh, anyway, introducing is long, it's uh, confident, two of the songs are like longer than nine minutes, it's a real mood. Uh, still sounds like it was recorded yesterday, still sounds like a future we're never going to arrive at, but what I want you to check out is uh, the follow-up private press, because uh, even though introducing was really influential, it wasn't necessarily commercially successful, um, So, which puts uh, this album in a very interesting position. Let me change track real quick. Okay, so when I hear this, the, the thing that I think of is, are there any other debut works by an artist that were so monumentally well received that it essentially damned its creator to never having the same impact again, even if the rest of their stuff is really, really good. Um, again, I stress, I love this record, but it, it was never going to blow the doors off the genre again. Um, it's impossible not to compare it to introducing. In fact, there's like six years between this and the private press coming out. And I think DJ Shadow is in a really unenviable position. I think he knew that he was damned if he made something that sounded like this again, but also if he went totally his own way and made something more unique, people were going to complain, oh, I just wanted more introducing. Um, there is like one really good example of that. Hold on, let me whack it on real quick. Walkie talkie, I think. So, introducing is like a real mood album. This is the kind of thing you put on at 2 a.m. and get your life changed for good, right? But this. Like, this is way more of a like club ready bit of music. It's got a lot of swagger to it. This just would not fit the mood of introducing whatsoever. Um. It kind of makes me feel like maybe the album is more of a personal thing for DJ Shadow, right? Maybe he saw the writing on the wall earlier than anybody else and was like, screw it. I mean, there's only so many uh, genre changing albums a guy can make, right? So I might as well do something that I personally enjoy listening to. I don't know. That, that's, that's an assumption I'm making. Um, let's try another song. So this is Six Days. This is probably DJ Shadow's, like, best-known five minutes of music. It's definitely the highest charting song he ever had. But it's a very good example of the DJ Shadow signature trick, right? Like, this is a Colonel Bagshot song, and I think a Dennis Joel song, and they're just blended together in a way that you would never be able to... How should I say? You'd never be able to identify what the original song sounded like from the way that he's blended them together here. This also has like a really beautiful music video by the guy who directed Chunking Express, by the way. Like, go, go, go check that out if you haven't. Um, yeah, I mean, the album's full of, uh, how should you put it, really? The album's full of... Like a, a more diverse sonic palette than uh, introducing has. This song, monosyllabic, like later on, this turns into this like crazy bit of breakbeat. 
It's also worth keeping in mind as well that uh, Private Press came out in 2002, and DJ Shadow was still going to vinyl shops and, uh, like, plugging these samples into a physical digital sampler, right? So this totally prefigures uh, the mashup album. Like, it would be really easy for people now to, like, pull two MP3s up and blend them together in a DAW, right? But think of any mashup album from the last 20 years, like, I don't know, Mouth Moods, um, Grey Album by Danger Mouse, uh, Wugazi, if, if you're familiar with that. All of those albums owe a debt to what DJ Shadow did with Introducing and, you know, his subsequent albums as well. Yeah, I would love to hear if you haven't heard Introducing and you haven't heard Private Press. Go away and listen to Private Press first, because you are a very rare specimen and uh, you are uniquely positioned to have an opinion on the sequel first before the Landmark album and figure out which one you like better. Ultimately, I think just what I'm trying to get at is that DJ Shadow mattered and, you know, maybe he could only change the world once, which is more than a lot of us are ever going to, right? I've not got a whole lot else to say, to be honest. I just love the album. Music's good, you know. Anyway, on to whatever's next. And there we have it. Shrine Offerings 2. Shrine Harder. Was this as good as the first one? Is that a question we should worry about less? I'm proud to put these out there, and it means a lot if you made it this far. I hope it's given you a couple of things to check out, think about, or suggest. Thoughts are always appreciated, so leave a comment. You can find my writing and ongoing roguelike deck building chronological history at shrunkenshrine.com if that interests you. My handle on everything is at shrunkenshrine, and I have a Discord server just waiting to be livened up by your presence. I would love it if you said hello, but for now, I'm going to say good night.